done some masking. He was, he was like, and so we used to hang out together. Uh, I had nothing to do with liquor, I promise you. It was just that he was against the masks, so I would go into the store all the time and we'd hang out, no mask. Oh, great to see your face, great to see your face, you know. And then, and then one day I went in there, he said, listen, I'm so sorry to ask, but uh, can you put on a mask? I said, what, what's happened? I thought you were, you know, one of the good guys around here. He said, well, I am. But the last time you were in here, some passers-by looked through the window and called the Department of Health. And then I got a visit, and they threatened to shut me down. So put on a mask. So if anybody tells you there is no mandates or no lockdowns, you hear this all the time. We never lock down. Uh, weird amnesia is taking place throughout the culture and politics. We pretend as if none of this ever happened. Anyway, the mask started to uh, annoy us. And then the elite said, you know, not a bad point. Not a bad point. This mask are terrible. You can take off your mask if you get the shot. <laughs> That's not a problem. Just get the shot. Just get the shot. And then it, you know, the pressure got enormous to the point that suddenly every newscaster in the country was an expert in pharmacology. And they knew for sure the shot was the greatest thing that ever happened. But at the end of this whole cycle of nonsense, not only were we required to get the shots, but they said we couldn't still take off our masks. And then we couldn't still unlock down. We were still, you know, told we can't gather in groups because your fellow citizens are pathogenic uh, disease vectors, all of you. So even to this day, even to this day, I feel myself really grateful to be in the presence of others at a meeting like this. There's really no replacing the physical meetup in this world. Yeah. So uh, we started Brownstone in order to connect these dots because I didn't see anybody else doing it. And, on, and by the way, it didn't stop there, right? I mean, so the, after the shop mandates, now we have the denial of the, the health effects of, of this stuff. We can't even get good data anymore. We're having to scour through these things ourselves, uh, try to figure out what's what, and read. You know, we're flooded by rumors. Also, uh, we're flooded by anecdotes of, if I can say so, death is all around us and and everybody's still we're still being gaslit oh that's just kind of thing that happens you know healthy uh 30 year old athletes just drop dead all the time that's just that's normal life i don't know what you're talking about so we're trying to figure this out we needed a research institute to do this but more than that what troubled me the most is that i saw so many dissidents intellectuals journalists attorneys uh, writers who were being um, displaced, dealing with tremendous professional upheaval. And I realized at some point, oh my goodness, it's all coming back again. The desperate need for sanctuary, the desperate need for some institution to bring people in, give them community, to take care of them and give them a bridge out, right? We never wanted to live in such times, but we've seen it in history. After the fall of Rome, in the interwar period in Europe, there are times when there's a desperate need for sanctuary. Nobody else is doing it, so that's what Brownstone did. Um, I think I was going to do this later, but I think right now, we did this last night, it was rather inspiring. We have a number of our fellows who are in the audience. What if you just stand up? All the fellows who are here. Yeah, fellows. Yeah, these are the fellows. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. It's fantastic. So that's one of our, our proudest things that, that we do. And actually, most of our, most of our resources are spent, uh, uh, expended uh, taking care of um, people who are in professional need and in exchange for which they are allowed to continue their work and continue fighting because these have been very demoralizing times for all of us. It's been a shocking thing to live through these times. None of us wanted this uh, and yet here we are and we need friends. We need community. We need support. 
So if Brownstone can do this, that's great. This is our one annual conference that we hold a year. That's a big public conference. We have a, um, a supper club in West Hartford that meets every month. Is anybody from the West Hartford supper club here? Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah, right? <laughs> it's uh, funny. It began in my living room, and then the living room got a little crowded, so we moved to a Chinese restaurant. So now it's... Um, it meets every month. We draw between 70 and 100 people there. If any of you uh, in your own community want to start a Brownstone Supper Club, you're more than welcome to. Uh, I would love to see this. Yeah, I would love to see it uh, branch out a little bit. So in addition to that, um, we, we publish books. Uh, I'm really happy to say that uh, just yesterday we got uh, Ramesh Thacker from Melbourne. I think, is Ramesh from Melbourne or Sydney? Or is... <laughs> Neither. Okay, that sounds like Sydney to me, no? <laughs> no, okay. Northern New South Wales, okay. Ramesh Thacker, who's been just a faithful contributor. Uh, thank you, Ramesh, for all you've done. Uh, his new book is uh, brilliantly titled Our Enemy, the Government. <laughs> this is great, great title. I'm really excited about it. Um, Brownstone started be, uh, in part, and you know, it's not the easiest thing to start a nonprofit. It's crazy. It's crazy. I didn't realize for the first six months, 90% of my time was doing administrative work. I didn't, there's no, it's not thrilling. It's just paperwork and uh, fundraising and that sort of thing. But I realized it had to happen because one night, I got a book in the mail, uh, in the email sent by Gigi Foster, Gigi and Paul Freigers. They're both here, um, and nobody was really making sense of the world. And this manuscript came in, and it was the sort of thing that my heart began to race from the first sentence, and I just couldn't stop reading it. I even read all the way through chapter 10, Paul. <laughs> I got through that one, too. <laughs> um, and so I, I lost a whole night's sleep. And I knew for sure this book needed to be published. And I wanted to be the one to publish it. So I wrote Gigi. And I said, listen, we're going to publish your book. She said, well, who's we? And I said, well, uh, Brownstone. She said, never heard of it. <laughs> I said, well, that's because it doesn't, well, how should I, it doesn't really exist. I said, well, how are you going to publish my book? And I said, well, I don't really know. Well, who are your editors? I don't have any. What's your marketing plan? Don't have one. And uh, so on it went for about two weeks. Um, finally, I just decided, that if nothing else, we need an institute to publish this book. Right, Gigi? Yeah. And... Uh, yeah, it's a brilliant achievement. And it still holds up, right? I mean, it's a, a mighty achievement. So that was our first book. In the meantime, we've published about seven books. So that's great. Um, just, uh, sorry, I get talking about our operations. One of the things that we do that people do not understand is we hold retreats, private retreats, for fellows and scholars to get together. I mean, intellectuals to discuss ideas in freedom and collegiality where we learn from each other. I mean, I know this is unheard of. <laughs> I mean, like Nobody's doing this anymore, but we're trying to do it. And we're holding now, I think, two a year. Um, I'd like to expand those to three or four. Um, there are only 40 people. Chatham House rules means that nobody can, there's no pictures and no reporting of what goes on. But I tell you what, my friends, it's just an inspiring occasion. It's really incredible. We have, we break it up into 30 minute segments. You can, you talk for 10 minutes and then everybody asks questions and discussions for just 40 people and it goes on for, for three days and it goes by so fast, right? But everybody who's attend, attended says it, it feels like, it feels like what we used to imagine the university was supposed to be like, you know? But that's how dark the times are. It's hard to find colleagues and friends from whom you can learn. And I will tell you this. 
despite all the darkness and sadness of our times, uh, these have been the most intellectually exciting times of my life. I mean, don't you feel like you've learned a lot over the last four years, right? I mean, it hasn't just been unbelievable. It's the number of issues that you used to put off the table and that now you're strongly considering, or the, the beliefs that you used to have that now you just reject out of hand. And we've all been through these times, but this is the urgency of our time to come to terms with the realities all around us and have adaptable, malleable minds to be truthful and honest with ourselves enough to take seriously things that we might have thought were impossible in the past. I'll just give you an example. Um, I used to think, as every pretentious intellectual does, that I knew I had an infallible uh, instinct for, for cranky, crazy theories versus true things, you know? And, and I said, uh, you know, I knew to reject that, that's dumb. And I knew that this was right. And, but now it's all been scrambled, you know. So <laughs> when people say crazy things to me, I'm like, well, it sounds a little crazy, but maybe I should give it another 30 days. Right? <laughs> that's the situation we're in. So those retreats are really valuable to us. And then... Um, Tom Harrington, our good colleague, friend over here, and my intellectual sparring partner. We used to spar more than we do now. Now we just, now we just sort of agree with each other. It's so strange. Um, but Tom has agreed to organize one of these in Europe for us because you say this what Brownstone's bringing needs to be brought to Europe because it's not there. So he's got a nice list of, of, of uh, scholars. We're going to do that in the spring, right? And Catalonia, right? Yeah. So here we are, uh, building a beautiful institution. Um, and people ask me all the time, did you know what it was, it was going to become? And of course the answer is no. Uh, all I knew is that we had a deep, desperate urgency for something someone to get serious about figuring this out because if we don't figure it out what hope do we have for rebuilding I mean like none if we if we just gonna go along and watch the random chaos watch our cities fall apart see public health just collapse see the world explode into war and say that's just stuff that happens nobody knows why we can't live like this We've got to figure it out. I'm not saying I have. I mean, I've been working on this three and a half years, and people ask me, why did this happen? I don't have an easy answer. There's too many moving parts. There's too much going on. But this is why, I mean, it, to, to be curious, to be scrupulous about your research, to be factually based, to be fearless in what you write and publish. That, to me, is the answer. And that is what we're trying to be. And that is why we're getting you know, more than a million page views a month and, and uh, making such a difference. It's precisely because there's an openness there to look at the facts, to grapple with the realities around us, to be fearless, name names, call out trends, to reveal truths as they come to us, to try to figure out how to get back that thing that I used to think was incontrovertibly true, namely human rights and freedom. It's not that complicated. These are beautiful ideals that emerged out of the Enlightenment. 500 years earlier, we started to gain glimpses of it, you know, with the Magna Carta and so on. It took us so long to build, and then in an instant, it all became fragile, negotiable, even gone. You don't recover right away from something like that. It takes a long time, a new generation. But we can't despair. We can't despair. We have to fight. And all of you have been tasked with something to do. It's our job in this generation, in these times, to do everything we can do. There are times in history where people are called upon to step up and make great personal sacrifices for the greater good, for the common good, for what we know is right and true. I'm sure that these are 
these times. I'm certain of it. And I feel blessed to be surrounded by so many great benefactors, great intellectuals, sincere writers. Oh, actually, before I close out these opening remarks, may I just, I think everybody who's ever written for Brownstone or had an article published on Brownstone should just stand because they're the fuel and the fire of this great organization. Yeah! Woo! Yeah. Yeah. These, these are the people on the front lines right here. Even those who write without their names on articles. <laughs> Just kidding, William Spruance. Um, <laughs> I'll let him tell you why he can't sign his articles. <laughs> you won't believe it. Um, no, but these these people are on the front lines and doing doing great work. And you know, um, uh, one of the things that that used to happen in the early 19th century is there's this guy named George Frederick Hegel who tried to convince the world that your ideas and your actions have nothing to do with the course of history. You know, there's there's a meta narrative out there. It's just sweeping over you, and you're just an observer, really. There's nothing you can do about it. And I don't think that. That's right. I think that's wrong. I think our history is made by us. It's made by individuals and their actions, and their actions are a result of their ideas. Ideas are the thing that makes history tick. Everything that's happening around us is a consequence of ideas, good or evil. We need to figure out the difference and rally around the good. That's how we make the world a better place. So thank you. We've got a very busy day today. You won't believe how quickly it's going to go. Uh, maybe you're startled by the schedule. There's not any speeches. We're just doing interviews and uh, discussions. So you'll get a sense of what it's like to live in a brownstone-style salon. I, I, right? I, I hope you enjoy it. I'm so grateful to all of you for coming. And now I'd like to invite up our first panelists. Yeah. Oh, good. Come on up. Thank you, David. Yeah, I don't know about this, um, this so setup. Let's, let's it's a little peculiar. Yeah, yes. I don't know. All right, hang on one Wait, second. What, what do you I think? To, no, let's semicircle these okay. a bit. Yeah. We need to, I, I think you're right. We need to be in the round yeah, here. Yeah, this is a little nutty. Theater in the round. There we go. A little and, more homey that you way. Like, where would you like me? Maybe just lording over you, standing like this? <laughs> <laughs> oh, over there, okay. All right, so uh, one of the things that's interesting is that... Uh, Brownstone deals a lot with the topic of infectious disease and public health, and yet um, its founder knows nothing about those subjects. Uh, well, I know something about it. Actually, oddly, I've been writing about it, about pandemic planning since 2005. Um, since 2005, when I first saw that there was these uh, crazy people that believed you could just lock down the world and make a, a germ go away. Um, I didn't use all my time this morning, just now, so just a quick story. I, I, right? But this, this is true. Um, in about a month into lockdowns, I, I, I had written already, you know, probably a dozen articles just screaming about this kind of stuff, and the phone rings. And a guy says, hi, this is Rajiv Venkaya. You know that name? Does anybody know that name, Rajiv Venkaya? Yeah. So he's, he's the guy who um, invented pandemic planning, invented lockdowns. And, and uh, he had a desk job at the White House in 2006 when the president came running into him and said, oh, there's going to be a pandemic. It's the bird flu pandemic. What should we do? And so he's the guy who set all the stuff in motion. And he called up his friend at San Diego National Laboratory who asked his daughter. And she said, well, I'm afraid of cooties too. And so she invented social distancing. She was 14. But anyway, 
So he's on the phone with me. He used to work for the Gates Foundation, head of viruses. Yeah, this guy's one of those guys, right? And he said, you really, really need to stop writing this way. It's very bad. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you just stop criticizing lockdowns. Lockdowns are, that's the way we do things now. Um, and you're just wrong. You're on the wrong side of history. And I said to him, um, well, that's not likely, but I do have a question for you. And I keep wondering about this because I can't figure it out. For a long time, we all social distance and we live in refrigerator boxes or whatever your plan is. What happens to the virus? He said, What do you mean? I said, what, Where does it go? I mean, does it just go away? Or well, what's your plan? He said, Well, we bring the R naught down and then the virus, and then it goes away. I said, You know, that's, you know that's not true. The R naught is a measure of what's already happened. You can't, you're mixing up cause and effect. You know this. So what you just said is untrue, and you know this. So what's your real plan? He said, Well, truth is, we've got a vaccine on the way. And I just laughed. I said, Oh, you've got a potion to inoculate the whole population against the coronavirus, huh? an infinitely mutating respiratory virus with a zoonotic reservoir? And you got a vaccine for this thing? Give me a break. Anyway, the conversation went on 30 minutes. I hung up the phone. Um, yeah, that's just one of the many stories. In the course of which, we linked up with the FLCCC, which is an organization born very much like, a, like Brownstone out of an emergency. Um, these doctors, Dr. Merrick is the founder, Dr. Cole is a very important figure. Both of them have been great heroes. Uh, one of the strangest features of the last three and a half years is that it was all done in the name of public health. Can you believe it? Public health's never been more catastrophically bad as a consequence of all this stuff. So the FLCC flew into a massive resistance mode. They came up with the uh, protocols uh, to actually deal with SARS-CoV-2 rather than just delay it and delay it and delay it and keep you from taking ivermectin and so on. Um, uh, for the whole length of the panel. Anyway, FLCCC and, and Brownstone have been, have grown together. So we now we've partnered up, uh, which relieves me from the burden of being an expert on this subject, which is why these guys are here. And then David Bell, who heads up our, uh, so here's Dr. Merrick, Dr. Cole, Dr. Uh, Dr. Bell heads up our pandemic planning. This is a new uh, group that is policing the World Health Organization and all of its infinite outposts, public. Uh oh. We dead? Oh, there we are. Okay. So, why don't I have all of you uh, make a quick opening statement about, let's just broaden it out to the, the state of public health and what, what you're thinking. Dr. Cole, why don't I start with you? Well, I'll start with a accidental Freudian slip from, uh, you were at a conference with me a couple weeks ago in upstate western New York, and the hostess, uh, Shannon, uh, we were having a evening Oh, there, okay, I'm on. And in a slip of the tongue, where we are with public health is we're suffering from wealth and hellness, not health and wellness. <laughs> and that's where we find ourselves, in an era where everything is money-driven. And follow the money. Look at the whole story of these last three years. Yes, are there different puppeteers and whatnot? Sure. Can you point the fingers at this agency, that agency? Absolutely. But it's wealth and wellness instead of health and wellness. Public health is broken. That's, that's my initial statement as to where we stand right now. So, um, Pierre and I often say the world's gone mad and it, it truly has gone mad. Everything is turned completely upside down. And so while we want to be optimistic for the future, unfortunately, I think recent circumstances are such that there's a lot to be scared of. Um, I think the, the implications of this massive vaccination, well, sorry, it's not a vaccine. We should stop calling it a vaccine. It's genetic therapy. 
I think the fallout from this billions of people who have been injected with a genetic vex genetic material is going to be really serious and um, both directly and indirectly and I think you know we, we still in for a rough time you know I think COVID was bad but I think the response as we all know was amplified the problem enormously and there's no question of doubt they're not safe they're not effective the fact that we're still vaccinating children we're vaccinating pregnant women is is a moral and ethical outrage and the fact that people just keep quiet and don't object is is preposterous and so i think we you know we 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 get it the problem is we are projecting to those who get it it's the people that don't get it that we need to change their mind and they need to see the truth because ultimately the truth will prevail you know you can't hide the truth it will come out but unfortunately i think the damage that will have been done will be immeasurable And David, uh, just a, a couple of remarks. You were trained in traditional public health, and these have been startling times for you. Yeah, so I, yeah, I, mean, I think we've, we've abandoned public health. We're not following public health. So, you know, lifespans increased because of better sanitation, um, better living conditions, better nutrition, etc. You know, we were all being told it's because we were injected with vaccines, etc. They came very late. Um, <clears throat> you know, the WHO defines health as including mental, social well-being. So it's completely illogical. It's not public health to concentrate on a virus and not concentrate on the other two. It's the opposite of public health. Um, you know, mass vaccinating the world when you know half the world is sort of under 25 years of age and they're already immune to a virus and diverting all those funds. When you know that poverty is the main cause of reduced life expectancies globally is not public health. So we're following something completely different. And I think, as you said, that's because of money. It's, um, you know, public health was once run by people trained in public health. It's now run essentially by people who are trained in software and who are very wealthy and see it as a way of increasing the wealth further and that's sort of corrupted the whole system. So it's not public health now, it's something completely different. It's a for-profit industry and public health has been there. Well, you know, this to me raises a very interesting question um, concerning lost knowledge. Mm. I, I don't entirely, I wonder if you have any theories about, about this. There's certain things we used to know for sure that are, seem to be gone. Uh, uh, natural immunity among many other things. Well, like Fauci said in 2018 uh, concerning influenza, natural infection is the mother of all vaccines, you know. <laughs> and, and so to lose common sense, I, I, I joke that common sense is no longer common, which, which we all know, but common science is no longer common. And just the basic, the basic construct of you know, vitamin D, you know, we live indoors, we work indoors, uh, we're immune suppressed. Anybody right now in the Northern Hemisphere not taking vitamin D right now is immune suppressed and vitamin K2, don't forget that. Um, we, we've lost the basics of medicine and, and physicians become automatons in a big system that is a Leviathan that it's hard to overcome. And, and to your point, that country doctor with the black bag just knows each individual family, each individual family member, each individual patient. We've lost that connection to humanity. We've lost our humanity in this process. So not only the knowledge loss, but it's more a loss of soul. And, and when you can just plug and place one physician into this system, okay, we need one for this position to do that, you become no more than a commodity and a bus driver, which is horrible to, I mean, I, we want to stay optimistic, right? 
Right. We do. We do. We do. Yes. Now, that oath is between a physician and a patient. You know, for primo, primo no nocere. You know, first do no harm, but that's physical harm, that's psychological harm, that's financial harm. And that's an oath between, it's an honor, it's a code, it's a covenant. And that's what we need to get back to, in addition to the basic science and the basic knowledge principles. But you don't get there until you change the culture of medicine. The, the culture of medicine has become commoditized with too many middlemen in the insurance industries and too many vendors and too many big companies. What we really need to do, um, we need to get away from big, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you take the P off pharma, it's harma. And I think we need to remember that. I mean, where, where are, so I'll, I'll shut up and let him let And Paul by the way, you're, you're welcome to jump in. You don't have to wait for me to ask yes, questions. Yes, so, so, you know, as David said, public health doesn't exist. It, it, it's, it's an illusion. And really, there are some really significant things that public health agencies could do to improve the public health, which is what their goal should be. Is And we know pharma has suppresses symptoms. Pharma doesn't treat disease. We know that lifestyle changes. And, and the, I mean, I'm an intensivist, and now I'm talking about diet, I'm talking about sleep, I'm talking about sunshine, I'm talking about relaxation. These are the things that keep people healthy and these are the things we should be talking about. If our damned healthcare agencies had said, everybody take vitamin D, and we agree with this, I mean, vitamin D, I mean, it, it may sound like a miracle, but if we had, and, and this, everyone in this room should be taking vitamin D, there's no question that it would significantly have impacted the course of this disease. This is a simple public health measure, but they weren't interested because there's no patent. It's, that's what it's all about. It's about making money and a patent. If you could patent the sun, pharmaceutical companies would patent the sun. And that's the problem. If there's no money to be made in it, people aren't, they're not interested in promoting health. And they're really simple things you could do I mean, example, cancer, and we maybe talk about it. Cancer is going to become the most important disease on, on this planet. It's going to overtake coronary artery disease. And there are simple measures, simple measures that people can take to reduce their risk of cancer by 40%. And this is proven by randomized, controlled clinical trials. But no one talks about it because cancer is big money. And so, you know, we don't have public health in this country. I don't know if we have it in the world, but that's what our goal should be, is to help people promote their own health. They need to be empowered to take control because the healthcare agencies certainly aren't gonna do that. And I think it comes back a bit to common sense. So we're being told, you know, we need to postpone cancer treatment and so on because we have this existential risk of pandemics that's increasing, etc. And we had, you know, the Spanish flu, people know about 1918. We didn't have antibiotics and most people died, as Fauci has written a paper on, from secondary bacterial infections. Now we have antibiotics that won't happen anymore. Right. There was a flu outbreak in the 1950s, one in the 1960s. Right. And that's it. Right. And so in a century we had two significant flu outbreaks. You know, swine flu killed less than the normal flu. You know, the, the, if you look at the Ebola, you know, SARS-1 killed 800 people. That's a third of the children that die every day of malaria in the whole world. You know. So uh, we haven't had any big pandemic for over a century. And we don't expect to because uh, medical care has improved in the last century. We have antibiotics. We we should be healthier. I mean, we should be eating better. So, yeah. so it's just it's the whole thing is illogical. We've just turned the world upside down. So, so could I just add sense. something about yeah. the 1918 pandemic, which people may not know? There was an effective treatment for for um, influenza pneumonia. <laughs> Yeah, masks are, pla are placed on the, on the rectum as a... 
Thanks. Uh, th this was done in Massachusetts. It was written up by, by the Attorney General. And what they did is they took the hospital bed from outside, from, sorry, inside to outside. They, they put these people in the sunshine. Yeah. That's what they did, the sunshine. The sun is there to cure. We should all be exposed to sun. And the mortality fell from 43% to 12% just by taking people into the sun. And so, you know, we forget that the sun is there for a really good reason, has, has curative powers. And most of us spend our, di our days indoors. We don't get ultraviolet light. We don't get infrared light. We have these lights that are, you know, LED lights. So we, we've lost our touch with nature and the way we were meant to be. Just an interesting thought. Yeah. And um, in COVID, we lock people in a room if they were positive. Yes. This is the opposite, and, and we're pretending we're evolving species. I mean, uh, we're not we going back. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. It's. Wow, uh, just a, a few questions. Uh, uh, the, the big question, the big question I have, which I don't think we've, maybe somebody has an answer for. I don't understand how every hospital in the whole country, in, in, in like one day, got locked down to everybody but uh, but COVID patients and uh, and and uh, emergency care. But otherwise, all diagnostics were, were gone, and all electrosurgeries were gone. Uh, uh, does anybody does anybody know how or why that happened? Because we have legislators that write bad laws, and if you, I'm not going to connect all the dots in one minute, but if you look at how our our system has allowed this to stack on top of that, on top of that, on top of that, to accumulate the power into just one or two individuals to make very bad decisions. That's happened. And so one dictator, one just very uneducated scientist, or pretend, pretend scientist, can say, I am the science, and all of a sudden people do that. And I'm not saying it's Fauci, you know, Becerra and, and Burks and others. That's the problem, is we're looking upward for the solution instead of looking inward for the solution. And so to be able to shut everything down like that and cancel everything instantly was insanity. There was no logic, no reason, no science. Uh, this wasn't Ebola. Uh, most of us that have immunology, virology, pathology backgrounds knew right away, wait, this is a coronavirus. Mm -hmm. So it, you, there was something at play well beyond the coronavirus. They wanted to create fear. Yeah, well, fear, fear, fear was that, the That's pandemic. what they wanted to do. They wanted to scare the shit out of everybody so they were shit scared and they would follow their narrative. And that, fear that's, that's what they wanted to do, and, is it was based on fear. And they were really right. very successful in doing this. And what's I fear? Mean, pe people did the most ridiculous things. They wore masks. They locked themselves indoors. I mean, kids' playgrounds were closed down. It was all based on, on fear. And, and you're saying that was a deliberate, uh, there was an effort to create that fear? I think, I think this was by design. Yeah. They wanted to scare people with the intent, the only answer to this problem is the vaccine. This is going to save us. And I think that's, that, that was planned. I think it was indoctrination, it was mind-bending activities to, to make people scared. And well, people are still scared. I and mean, fear is very simple. False expectations as real. And, and you just throw those things in front of people and like, oh no. And they, I mean, and, and look in retrospect, you know, here we are, bad flu season at best. Was that the worst pandemic ever? No, it wasn't, absolutely not. And yet we still hear the mantra and you know, I'm sitting on a plane with a, a lovely 80 year old couple a week ago, both masked, I'm so sorry, I'm lowering my mask, I'm, please take them off. And we still have you know, these remnants within society oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and trying to expunge 
this fear is, I think, critical. And, and giving people optimism and hope, I think, is critically important in healthcare, in public health, in messaging, in, in empowering people to say, look, the best doctor you will ever meet is here right now. And I don't mean that with arrogance or hubris, because it's you. Look in the mirror. You are the best doctor you will ever have. And if we empower people with knowledge to take care of their own bodies, that's how we change health. Public health is getting the individual caring about who they are and how they are. So I think Ryan's right that the way to overcome fear is to empower people with knowledge. So they, they can understand that this is all BS and they can empower themselves. They are in control. They have control in what they can do. can figure out precisely what happened. It's really bizarre. At the supper club the other day, we had a guy who was uh, in charge of delivering ventilators. It's his business. He delivers ventilators and diagnostic equipment to New York hospitals. And he said, I can tell you, during those uh, strange, dark times in, in the early, early part of, uh, in, in the middle of March, right when the lockdowns happened, he said the hospitals all over New York, but for two, were complete ghost towns. They were empty because people were afraid to go to them. Mm. And, and you know the whole canard about the, uh, the freezer trucks, because you, when Fauci's interviewed now, every once in a while somebody will ask him about lockdowns, and he'll say, well, we had to, have, we had to lock down because, because look, there were, there were freezer trucks with bodies in them. Well, that happened after, that's, that's not correct. That happened after the lockdowns, and the reason was that the coroner's offices were all closed. And so were the funeral homes, and everybody was afraid to touch the bodies, and they didn't have anything to do with the bodies, so they d d drove up freezer trucks and hurled a, a very, at least according to my friend, a very normal amount of death that you would have in a regular day in freezer trucks. And then the news media shows up and says, ah, freezer trucks in New York, ah, it's, a, it's a terrible pandemic happening. So it's so spooky when you deconstruct these details. It's all just the, weird. The important thing, Jeffrey, is when you put clowns in charge, you get a circus. <laughs> but it wasn't just the people in charge, so the medical profession went along with this. I know, they That's were clowns too. Thing to me. At least we gave them the makeup. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, the, the, the fear the, for the general public affected the medical profession the same way. We feel, you know, they're, they're just as susceptible to fear and to... Uh, so, so this only, the clowns in charge could only do this with compliance of almost everyone mm -hmm. from the bottom. And, you know, there, there are hospice nurses who would not let families see their dying relative in case they infected the dying relative with COVID and ridiculous things like this. You know, this happened over and over again all over the place, you know, in intensive cares, you know, neonatal, the parents couldn't be with the child. So these are the same staff who a year earlier would have been, you know, paragons of sort of virtue in helping the families with the dying, and you know, everyone would have raved about how what wonderful people they were, and people just completely flipped yeah, in, in the health field. Well, and also, you remember those days uh, the news media was, was filled with death announcements. Oh, today, you know, Andrew, yeah. today another 50 people have uh, COVID in your community, and, and another three people are dead, and hear their names, and it was every single day in the headlines was just death and sickness and death and sickness, and now, here here we are, as far as I read the data, we're in a period of unprecedented excess deaths going on right now, and it's all vanished. It doesn't matter. You, can, you can't fund it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the statistics are astounding when you look at it, and I, I commend my friend Ed Dowd, what he's done with some of the data sets that have been pretty much hidden, and, and to roll out an experimental gene-based injection on humanity and then ignore the signals is, is unfathomable. And as Dr. Malone points out many times, and great friend, um, you know, this is a psychological operation. It's the fifth generation of warfare. You know, it's look here, you know, BLM, look here, rainbows, look here, Ukraine, look here, climate, look here. But they don't want you to see what's really happening. And I think, you know, obviously we're talking about medicine, but it's, it's all the Venn diagrams overlapping and just trying to figure out how to message. I think that's the important thing that Brownstone does is it's obviously a very intellectually strong institute 
and getting that message out to people to think for yourself because we need to overcome each of these obstacles. There is still the fear. There, as David points out, even in a noble profession, people drank the Kool-Aid. Yeah. How do we un-Jim un -Jim Jones those and people? What do we do about the medical profession going forward? I'm sorry, these are huge questions, and I, I want to take two minutes on this and go to question and answers. By the way, do we have a microphone? Uh, for the clock. Yeah. Uh, oh, for, like for, for, for questions, audience. I wonder, Janet, do we have, where's Janet? She's not around. I don't know how we're going to do the questions. Maybe we just have to stand up. Um, but, yeah, like, could you just give me a quick, each of you, just explain the way, let's say we have some sincere legislat legislators and we want to fix up uh, the medical profession. You know, what would we do, or is that even a hope? If it's not a hope, what are we going to do in the meantime? So what we've done is we've, we've had conversation with many legislators and basically what we need to restore is the patient-physician relationship is that the government, the health agencies have no place, the FDA, the CDC, in directing how patients and physicians interact and that sacred Hippocratic relationship. That has been eroded and that's what we need to restore is the, the government, the health agencies have no place in, in interceding in the sacred relationship, which is what medicine is based on. It's a, re it's a relationship between the patient and the physician. There's something called informed consent, which we've forgotten about. You know, you have a discussion and the patient agrees to the therapy that the physician is suggesting. And that has been eroded. We, we've lost the patient-physician relationship. And pharmacies, healthcare agencies have no place in interfering in that sacred relationship. And that's legally, uh, that we seem to be making progress on the legal front, right? We, that law went down in California. Maybe 209A. Yeah. Uh, um, some good aspects, but still, a lot of injury has been done to the freedom of, of doctors to prescribe and and many doctors are facing terrible persecution from medical boards. Yeah, I mean, and, and this, is, this is where it takes everybody to get involved, you know, one by one. Um, I think we suffer from safety and comfortism in many parts of the world. And to stand up, think globally, act locally, but act at that local level. So I got involved, I got voted onto my central district health board. Wherever you see something wrong, do the Gandhi thing and you know, be the solution. Be the solution that you want to see, be the change you want to see. So I think where we start is locally. Local, 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 that organic grassroots level. Wherever you are, change your community, change your local culture. And, and, and that's how it grows. Um, yeah, we're under horrible attacks because we've allowed this regulatory monster to grow over all these years. We do need to change those things, and it, that's a stepwise process, and it's taking it apart brick by brick and rebuilding it. It's, it's, it's no easy task, and I think the, the critical thing, and I'll credit Dr. McCullough for this one, is be relentless. Whatever you do, be relentless, and, and silence is compliance, so be involved. Yeah. David, do you have any comments about this? Well, it's, yeah, I agree that local thing is most important. I think at the top end, we've got to undo conflict of interest somehow. And, you, know, you, you cannot, if you're connected with the FDA, you cannot be taking money from the private sector within five or ten years, etc. If you, you know, WHO cannot take money yeah. from private interest full stop, yeah. even if they need the money. And yeah. well, we've got to just regain the, the, the realisation that private is there for profit, not for the public good. Yeah. And they're two different things. Yeah, it's all gotten mixed up, hasn't it? It's just yeah. a tremendous mess. That's been a real uh, education for me over the last. Well, listen, we have uh, just few, uh, we have about uh, 13 minutes. I what if we should do some Q&A. Go ahead. Paul and Brian used the word they. Who is they? Oh, who is they? <laughs> T-H-E-Y. They hover everywhere yet. 
<laughs> that's, a hard, that's a hard question. Who are the they? And, and again, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a collusion and a cabal of the corruption, the corrupted. I, I, I don't know. And no one of us is as dumb as all of us. And so I think these circles of greed that just feed on each other, oh, they're doing that, okay, we'll do that, okay, oh, they're doing that, okay, oh, hey, here's an opportunity. And then we willy-nilly do pass laws that compound on each other, and then when you go back and look at the code of federal regulations and look what Congress did to change pandemic planning, et cetera, time and time again, yeah. it's this, it's a compounding problem. Yeah. So. And then, then here's the problem, the accountability never comes. Go back to the thalidomide crisis, no accountability. Go back to the Vioxx crisis and all, all those tragically killed with a horrible drug there, no accountability. So I don't know who the they are and everybody, you know, has their, it's this group, it's that group and there's puppets above this and governments behind that, I don't know. I don't know, but I think we all see that it's happening. And I think there are better dot connectors in some of those realms outside my expertise. I what don't the, know. One of the terrible things we've discovered at Brownstone, you probably know this, but, uh, and it was Debbie Lemon who first identified this to me, that the, the rulemaking authority during the pandemic response was, was not the CDC or the NIH. It was the uh, uh, FEMA, Department of Homeland Security, and the National Security Council. That was very clearly stated in the great edict of, uh, February, of um, March 13th, uh, and then it mutated. So this is one of the reasons we're having such a hard time getting information, do you know? Because it's all classified. Isn't it crazy? It's very simple. I mean, you know, how do you define an elephant? It's a mouse built to government standards. And so, <laughs> and how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? And so it's, it's tearing that elephant down back to making it a mouse again. Yeah. And so the they are too many layers of too many rules, too many laws, too many regs over too much time. Tom, Marks. Yeah, um, Jeffrey, uh, a couple days ago you wrote an article where you defined the strategy that you think was locked out Response to Joe Nochera's article in New York Magazine. Did you read it a couple of days ago? Um, the, the article is calling, uh, saying that the lockdowns failed, and their new book called *The Big Fail* is actually the first in three and a half years, the first breakout we've had into the mainstream. The first one. And I was thrilled by the article, but uh, Jenny, you can bring that up here. We should make people walk up and do a, a, a little public thing before their extremely short questions. Um, but the article said, at the end, they said, well, not everything was a failure. Of course, Operation Warp Speed was a tremendous success. And I call this the exogenous theory of the vaccine, uh, which I've learned is not right. It's wrong. Uh, you never could have gotten this thing approved, uh, absent the emergency powers and the panic and the fear and the thing and the bad health and the extra 20 pounds and the drunkenness and the pot pandemic and all the rest and the ill education and oh God, what a disaster. Um, and they're like, oh, please give us a shot. Um, so yeah, it, it's all it's all connected, right? So and that and according to Jay Bhattacharya, uh, this is the new White House plan for, for the next time is lock down the vaccine, lock down the vaccine. So it's just like out of the movies, you know? Have you ever seen the movie uh, called Contagion? <laughs> Yeah, so terrible disease uh, that's both uh, widespread and killing everybody, which is basically impossible, absent, you know, a, a, an eight-week period of latency. But um, that would never happen. But in the movie, there's the great inoculation that comes along and saves everybody, right? So this is what they're, they're trying to reenact, this fantasy. It's predictive it's, programming. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. now if you come up to the microphone, make yeah. sure you stand six feet apart. Yes, I uh, uh, just saying. No. Yeah. All you disease yeah. vectors, you know. <laughs> that, uh, yeah, let's see how this goes. Let's see how it goes. I guess it's the test dummy. Yeah, you should, I don't know, can it lift up and... I can or, speak loud. Yeah, or something, yeah. Check, check. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's good. Okay, so I guess one of my questions, you alluded to it a little bit, and my name is Robin Tyner, I'm of background in science, oceanography, 32 years active duty, and um, 
but on the medical side of things, there's people that I know that saw right through the COVID, didn't get a shot, all of that type of stuff, and then, you know, ones that surprise you, but the people that saw that then come to other things, cancer, needs one for main thing. Oh my God, you got to do what the doctor says and they're going to save your life. And, and then you question that at all and you're crazy and there's a standard of care thing right. that then, well, you go get another opinion and you find out that everybody's got the same of opinion because they have to like you look at the checklist and you see X so you diagnose, you know, diagnosis X equals give them Y with no individual thought. And I'm just wondering how you think what has happened just with the shots is parlays on to all these other diseases in, in society. A group think problem. But it is. It's absolutely a group think. And uh, I mean, very briefly, again, no one of us is as dumb as all of us. It's guidelines destroying medicine. A guideline is a guideline, but it doesn't make you an individual. And, and that loss of individuality, that loss, like David said, of informed consent, um, and, and you're not an algorithm, and you are not a recipe, and a baker goes in and makes a lovely cake, great, but you are not a cake. You are a more complex organism than a cake. So doctors following algorithms, then yeah, we turn all, all of medicine over to AI and lose the human touch. And this is what we're up against. I mean, you point out a, a very obvious problem, and, and it's... It's that ability to think freely and want to have what you want for you, not what a system wants for you. Um, I mean, we could talk for an hour on that. I mean, you bring up so many great points. In, in it's really the first time in recent medicine that there's one way of doing things. This is the narrative, and you will not deviate. And if you deviate, you are a conspiracy theorist, and you will lose your job. And they've been very successful in establishing this is the only way. There's no alternative that they've censored any discussion. There's no discussion. We can't have a conversation. We, we know we, we may not always agree, but at least we have a discussion. Yes. We've created this environment that this is the only way. If you go to hospital, you get remdesivir. Even though remdesivir will kill your kidney and kill you, you get it, and there's no alternative. They've created this monstrous, situation. The death of dialogue is the death of the patient. That there's no dialogue, there's no discussion. This is what the they, whoever the they is, want to be done. And it's terrible for patients because it's this way or the highway. Uh, obviously there are people here who actually understand that there are alternatives. Um, my name is Neil Berkowitz. I'm a family physician in San Diego for the last 40 years, and I have my own practice. I um, have not worn a mask for one day in my practice, have not been vaccinated. But I just want to address the question of um, who the what they is. The they is us. We've allowed ourselves for this to happen. It's not a they, because you're not going to get an answer to the they. It is us who have given up our liberties and have allowed all this to happen to us. So I don't think the question should be who is they is. We should be looking at ourselves. That's a great comment. Uh, uh, thank you for that. Idea. You know, I, 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 you, you were talking about the Matthias Desmet thesis, which I think is just such a great book on group psychology. An elaboration on Freud, I might add. <laughs> But it's surely a combination, right? Bad actors manipulating fearful people, something yeah. like that. But with that something like that. I was going to say the same thing, because I think it is us very much. And in the medical profession, it is doctors who gave that remdesivir. And yeah. it's doctor, those doctors knew it is harmful to the kidneys. They gave it to people with failing kidney junction. Well, they're still done. dishing out packs a little bit like it's candy. Well, I, I, I always quote Twain, the man who does not read has no advantage over the man who cannot read. And so we get into this conversation and this group thing, but people aren't willing to look at the data, yeah. and they aren't willing to actually read the paper. And, and you know, the, the abstract says this, and the conclusion gives the genuflection to the genetic shot. But you go in the data sets, and, and they have nothing to do with what the papers and, and conclusions are. 
You're like, wait a minute, read. And if doctors would actually, you know, how do you hide a $200 bill from a surgeon? You put it in a textbook. I mean, I, you, <laughs> this is the problem is the hubris of knowledge is, is really damaging. And so I think we, we can do these discussions in silos sometimes, but if we don't have the dialogue that Paul points out, how do we improve things? And David's absolutely right. I think, yeah, go ahead. There we are. <laughs> Hello, uh, Chris Baker. I have a podcast called Fountainhead Forum. Uh, considering missed mammograms, missed colonoscopies, missed cancer screenings, how many preventable cancer deaths are going to result from these idiotic, sadistic, and violent policies? Unfortunately, the data sets are coming out. Uh, Ed Dowd, about two weeks ago, if you go to financetechnologies.com with a PH, um, just put out the data set from the deaths and that people say, oh, you know, this uptick in cancer that we're seeing that I pointed out years ago. Um, we're going to see this continuing. I was here in Texas last week talking to one of the busiest oncologists in the state. At first he saw clotting, then he saw leukemias, now he's seeing the solid tumors. And the powers that be will tell you, oh, it's because we had all the missed screenings during the early part of the pandemic. But if you look at the UK data from age 15 to 44, go to, go to Ed's website, age 15 to 44, that's a group that you don't screen, because that's a group generally where you don't see cancers. Look at those graphs, 10 years running and all of a sudden 2021, 2022. It is off the charts, deaths per 100,000 in those age groups. Same thing in the, in the private German insurance uh, company data sets in the pediatric population. The data is being hidden. I mean, the, the data is there. Our health and human services owes us this. I know Senator Johnson has tried to get them through FOIA requests and through many demand letters. And Becerra is sitting on it doing nothing. Uh, the data is there. You can look at the vaccination rates, you can look at the cancer rates. This was a genetic modulation that we injected into a lot of people. A lot of people are fine, that's the good news. A lot of people essentially got a dud. I want people to be scared, but I want people to be rational. If something doesn't seem right, make sure you get checked. Finance, P-H, technologies.com. You know, it, it's infuriating because, uh, I'm sorry, but very early on, I think it was Martin Kuldorf told me, but as a result of all the misdiagnosis that we're going to see in a cancer epidemic, he said this in like July of 2020, and we knew, everybody knew this was coming. Yeah. It, it's just well, ghastly. Well, we screen for cancer to reduce it. So yeah. Stop screening, it'll go up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, go. Um, thank you all for a great panel. Uh, my name is Lauren Pear. I wanted to talk about a comment that Dr. Merrick made that I thought was really important. We can all talk to each other. We already all agree. I was wondering if you all have found any strategies of talking to people that don't agree and opening their mind. And if you're familiar with the book, How to Have Impossible Conversations yes. by Peter Bogosian, and if you think those tactics might be effective. That's a great recommendation. So if you didn't hear her, How to Have Impossible Conversations, good, good read. Yeah, our, our reach is, has, has been, as I say, we're reaching a million people a month, you know, so it's, 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 it's something. You know, I think about this all the time. It's like, what's the, the best way to make sure that there's no change is to do nothing. So, you know, uh, we're doing you know, some, something, but we could definitely expand. Get yeah, I, I think you start the conversation slowly. You know, you don't want to overwhelm them with all the data because it's overwhelming. So you have to nibble at them slowly to try and, you know, open their eyes because they're completely blind. And if you see the big picture, it's, it's overwhelming. So I think you have to nibble at little pieces. And it's very simple. I mean, nobody uh, cares how much you know until they know how much you care. So you have to st uh, start with that love, that kindness, that friendship, that comfort, a little bit of humor, and then get into the uncomfortable things. And then, you know, talk about politics and religion at Thanksgiving dinner, you know? Did I, I think we're going to need a book of epigrams by Ryan. <laughs> So we're going to take we're going to take a 10-minute uh, break and be back and talk about the uh, other good news uh, concerning the utter corruption of journalism. <laughs> oh, so, <boy>. my apologies. <laughs> oh, ten minutes.
Wow, all right, we're ready to go. Good. We're, we're falling behind. This is a great tragedy. And Debbie's coming, where is she? The intrepid Debbie Lemon. Come on, Debbie, you're late. You're making everything fall behind schedule. Okay. All right. Uh, wow, so many topics to cover, right? I mean, we can't possibly cover everything. Um, but a major annoyance to me has been been the um, the catastrophe of journalism, uh, and, it, and it makes me sad because you know we like to think we live in a world in which journalists find out stuff and write about it. <laughs> it doesn't seem like a lot to ask, but um, uh, something, something went very wrong over the last three and a half years, or maybe it's been wrong a lot longer than that, and I just didn't entirely notice it. You know, there was a day uh, at some point, oh, I remember what it was. It was uh, February 27th, 2020 when the New York Times decided to let its uh, pages be turned over to the CIA or something, uh, or to Pfizer, <laughs> same thing. Um, uh, <laughs> Do you know that if, if I had somebody said that to me four years ago, I would have thought you were an insane person. <laughs> I don't believe that stuff. Um, something went very wrong. Anyway, we've got Debbie, the intrepid Debbie Lehrman, who deserves one of those Pulitzer Prize if that had any credibility left. We need, a, we need our own brownstone prize, right? Gabrielle Bauer, the author of uh, uh, Blindside is 2020, and you've got a little presentation we might start with. Adam Crichton has been, uh, is one of the world's greatest economics reporters, and he's been all over this from the very beginning. How you got your articles in the, I don't understand, but you were one of the few truth tellers on the planet Earth from the very early days. And then and James Bovard, who, who, whose collected works uh, could be described as the corruption of everything and everyone forever. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Anyway, it's a very exciting panel, and I'm, I'm just looking at the time and realizing that because we're starting a little late, we have a good excuse to go a little bit longer, which I think we should, actually. <laughs> So, um, th is Stefan Kinsella here? I, he sent me a, t oh, no, he's not. Okay, it means I can make mistakes and he won't call me out on it. That's good, because that's all he does. Um, all right, why don't we start, why don't we start with you, Gabrielle, is it okay? Would you like to stand, or are you, are you like that sort of, rep that repose, that sort of luxuriating look? Um, I guess I can just stay here. I wanted to just okay. do something different. I wanted to make a, to share something with everybody. Um, I've been a journalist and medical writer for the past 29 years, and over the past three years, uh, I've written 30 plus COVID essays, some of them for Brownstone, and throughout this process, I compiled a five-page list of freedom-friendly publications and other news outlets. Um, because I found, you know, through trial and error, that some publications were open to what I had to say and others were not. So I have this list and I would love to share it with you and with anyone who might be interested in, um, in, in writing your own stuff and submitting it as op-eds or essays or substack or whatever. So, since it wasn't really realistic to make five-page copies for everyone in attendance, what I'm proposing is anyone who is interested in, in obtaining this list, just email me. My email address is available on the Brownstone website under authors, or you can just look up my name. My own website has my email address, and I'll be happy to send it to you. What do you think about uh, writing that up for, for Brownstone? Have you considered that? 
just writing an article about this. About oh, very interesting idea. Yeah. 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 I yeah. That that's, this is why I'm a great editor. I just make everybody write everything they say. Okay, I'll add it to my to-do list. <laughs> okay. Um, it, it has been frustrating, hasn't it? Uh, almost like we have to revive. <laughs> Well, just like we have to re rebuild everything, since everything fell apart, we have to rebuild journalism too, it seems to me. Um, Adam, is it okay if I start with you? I mean, I would, I would, like, I would like to know, maybe some memoirs, because, because uh, at the time, you're living in Washington, D.C., but at the time you were in Sydney. Sydney, right. I don't think your mic's working. Is this still on? Yeah. Can I turn it on? Uh, my friends in the back, can we uh, get uh, Adam's shout? Uh, I, can just, I can just speak loudly. No, uh, um, uh, nice people in the back, can we... Uh, Sorry, uh, um, <laughs> anyway, so yes, so I was in Sydney, and I was the uh, you know, mild-mannered economics uh, journalist at the Australian. <laughs> yeah, nobody can hear you, so let's... Uh, I don't know how to work these things. Um, it says it's on. Testing. Oh, no. Well, maybe while we. Oh, here comes. Here comes our, our technician now. Hmm. Ah. Oh, there we go. Oh, the old fashioned way. <laughs> okay, so take that. Okay. Uh, yes, you're asking me kind of where I, I was at the time. So, uh, this is early 2020, and I was in Sydney. I was the economics editor of The Australian, which is a national broadsheet newspaper. Uh, I guess you'd say the paper of record in Australia. Um, so I wrote mainly about economics, and then, of course, you know, the virus came upon us, and I just followed all the data, and I realised, I think, fairly soon that it was nowhere near as lethal or dangerous as, as the media were making out. And so I started writing about that. Uh, my first article was the 14th of April 2020, and it was entitled, uh, We Might Be Overreacting to an Unremarkable Virus. What was the date? 14th of April 2020. 14th, you need to hold the mic. Sorry, 14th of April 2020. 14th. And that went crazy, that article. Absolutely crazy. It was almost like I'd you know, endorsed the Third Reich or something. Uh, and yet it was what I thought a fairly reasonable view that I put forward, which I think has turned out to be completely vindicated uh, by the facts. And so throughout 2020, I wrote about the COVID response and the madness of it pretty much every week. And uh, I'm grateful to, to the Australian, to News Corp for publishing me every week, they did. Uh, and there was a very receptive audience, at least amongst uh, you know, a large minority of people, I would say, uh, who agreed that it was insane. But there was, very little, uh, there was very little support for me in the rest of the mainstream media, I would say. And there continues to be very little, even though I think I've been vindicated. Well, since you were, you were sort of a big shot at a big shot newspaper, can you tell me something? Because in the middle of February, there were quite a lot of articles, actually, uh, in the mainstream press that were saying we're overreacting to the coronavirus, right? I mean, this was um, Psychology Today had an article like that. Uh, Slate had an article like that. I mean, Fauci had an article in New England Journal of Medicine saying more or less that about a week after that. So this was not entirely an unconventional conventional line at the time. And then suddenly everything changed where everybody was on the same page and whipping up a kind of an out of control frenzy and I'm going to estimate that that was certainly uh, in place by March 1st, for sure. You know, three days after the New York Times started this. So, um, what did, do you have any insight on, on how this might have happened? The group thing. Uh, yeah. Well, I think because most journalists now come from the same socioeconomic background, <clears throat> at least in the elite publications, and their instinct is to agree with the bureaucracy. Uh, you know, they're the same people, they're the same socioeconomic class. 
And I think that explains uh, so much of the, of the cheering for whatever the bureaucracy was recommending. I think there were, there's a lot less, at least in my experience, I mean, I was never told not to write this or you write that. You say you were never told? Never, that. never, never. Um, but I just had a different view. Uh, you know, I th and, you know that's, a, that's a deep question as to why. I, I spent most of my career prior to, to the COVID pandemic attacking uh, regulatory capture in the finance sector. And, and so I guess that's, you know, that's kind of an outlier view too. Uh, so I was very anti-bank, I suppose. Um, and there's so much propaganda around the finance system uh, that most journalists uh, swallow, uh, but I did not. And so then this other issue came along and I just treated it in the same way. Uh, but, but I think groupthink amongst journalists is, is extreme, I think. Uh, and it's very hard to fix. And there, isn't there also a, a, like a careerism here too? But it always worries me in the in the U.S. because whatever the New York Times says, that everybody wants to be a New York Times reporter. You know, that's sort of the career goal. It's like getting tenure, you know, at a university or something. Um, and so whatever the New York Times says, everybody all the way down to the local crime reporters are like echoing that same uh, position. Well, and that's, you know, it's partly a function of economics. I mean, the, the economic model of these big prestigious publications is to pay low salaries, right? Because they're partly paying the reporters in prestige. Whereas in most jobs, you don't get paid in prestige. You just get the financial compensation. That's the yeah. vast bulk of jobs in the world. But in the media, there is this prestige element. There's a, there's a fame element, and that means that media companies can pay substantially less. Yeah. And of course, when you do that, you generally get uh, children from upper classes who are applying for jobs. so true? And so that goes to my point earlier. Earlier, is you have at the New York Times in particular, you have the children of the upper class working there. Yeah. Uh, because they don't, you know, they don't need huge salaries because they have family money. And so that gets this extraordinary group thing. Uh, and and uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually less, it's a less that way in Australia than it is in the US and the UK. And that, that partly explains me. And I think that's a, you know, that's a good thing. But, uh, but in the US, certainly, it's a very different model. You, you understand what he's saying, right? I mean, th this, is, this is weird. Uh, I've only recently found this out, but like this finance jobs at, at, at Christie's uh, pay far lower than they will at your local Edward Jones office. And this is partially because, yeah, the prestige element. So it's it's very strange. And it means that only the elites can get the elite jobs because they're all being subsidized by their parents or they have, they have money in the bank or whatever. One more point, too, I yeah. think that's, uh, that's worth making is, that, of course, journalists don't have tenure. So they can be sacked very easily. And so that, that could, uh, you know, that, that could, and I'm sure it does, uh, create a lot of hesitation amongst journalists who might be thinking about writing a particular point of view, but they just think it's not worth it. Right. So, um, so the jobs are not so fungible. Like, for example, if you get sacked from, if you're working at uh, Great Clips as a haircut or whatever, and, and you don't like the boss, you quit, you can go down a mile down the road and get another job. It's exactly the same, right? But in journalism, if you lose your position at the uh, at Atlanta Journal of whatever, uh, then you get bumped down to the Montgomery, you know, whatever. Then then you're a loser. And and your chance for, for going to uh, the Dallas Morning News is, is shot, right? So, so these, these positions are uh, are a little bit uh, yeah, involved. and it's you know it's also the uh, your journalists now are typically educated with one or two, sometimes three degrees, uh, which is totally different to 40, 50 years ago when they typically hadn't been to university at all, and they were a lot more skeptical of authority. Uh, whereas now, as I said, they're from the same social milieu, you know, Harvard and Yale and this country and so forth. I mean, if you look at the CVs of people at the New York Times, it will be very similar to the CVs of young academics, right? They're just as educated, and that certainly doesn't mean they get things right, as we've seen. Yeah. But on paper, they're very educated. Yeah, it really does speak to this profound issue of the importance of class in what's happened over the last three and a half years. This is entirely a, a, a ruling class, upper class racket, as far as I can tell. Debbie, you were going to talk. I just wanted to add to what you were saying, Adam. Um, Robert, in his book, uh, Robert Malone's book, talked about um, journalism isn't really about investigating anymore. Uh, and at the top journalism schools, they teach something called advocacy journalism. Now, to me, that's an oxymoron, 
you can't have advocacy and journalism, right? It's either advocacy or journalism. But if people think that what they're doing in journalism is they're supposed to advocate for a certain position, then they're not going to be doing journalism anymore. And that's pretty much what's happened. So it's not, it's the prestige and it's everybody coming from the same class and having the same opinion. And also the, their, one of their opinions is that journalism is supposed to advocate for the positions that their class advocates for. Yeah. It, all of which reminds me, of, you know, New York Times for for for, the, for two years we're running articles about like type in your zip code and we'll tell you what to do. <laughs> and so you type in your zip code, they're going, oh, coronavirus is spreading in your community. You need to not travel. You should stay home and have your groceries delivered. Right. By people who don't read the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> these people delivering these groceries, they don't care. Um, now, let's, now, since you are a graduate of Harvard, and... Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was funny. <laughs> um, uh, I didn't wear my hokey t-shirt today. <laughs> and this, and, uh, this being Texas, hokey refers to Virginia Tech. Um, yeah, okay. I'm also not a, I'm a, I'm a dropout, not a graduate. Okay. Oh, yeah, that makes two of us. I also dropped out of Harvard. Oh, did you? Okay. <laughs> Jim, uh, you're always reliable, Jim. You you never bought this narrative from the very beginning, but somehow you kept most of your publication outlet has been the New York Post, right? Uh, lately, yeah, I did uh, a number of uh, COVID bashes for USA Today. Yeah, uh, they were uh, they had a really good editor there. He's no longer there, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean there were uh, there were places that were open ideas that were very critical of the pandemic status quo. Uh, the thing, one thing got me focusing on a lot more was when you contacted me in May of 2020 and asked me, hey, would you like to write something for us? And so, so I sent back, I said, well, how much do you pay? Uh, so, and we eventually came to terms and I did a lot I of remember. stories. What? Yeah, I remember. Yeah. What was I supposed to say? No, I, no, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> that did a decent job during the pandemic, but they were out overwhelmed. It's interesting, there was a piece in the Washington Post in uh, October 2021, I think. It was by an MIT professor, and he was focusing on the controversy about whether or not the US had funded gain of function research at, at Wuhan lab. And he made the point brilliantly, brilliantly that there was, it was insane to, be, uh, to do any financing of what could be a mass weapon to kill millions of people. It didn't matter at this specific lab or this specific grant. The entire idea of the U.S. government, AID, NIH, whoever, funding gain-of-function research uh, that could be a mass uh, deadly weapon was crazy. And that was in the Washington Post. It, was, it made a lot more sense than what the vast majority of news coverage was. But every now and then there was stuff that would pop up. The Post had a couple articles op-eds by the FDA vaccine chiefs who, who resigned in protest after the Biden White House sought to force him to approve, give full approval to the uh, Pfizer vax. And so there were folks that spoke out and laid out that, okay, these are the crimes, these are the cover-ups, these are the follies, but they didn't get traction. So. Uh, Debbie, how does, it, how does it turn out to be the case that so many of the big breakthroughs and understanding have come from 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 the brownstone crowd. <laughs> like, how did, what, what's, this is not the way the world should work. I'm horrified. I don't want to be the one doing this. Yeah. Uh, and I only started doing it because nobody else was. Yeah. And because you gave me and us a platform for it. Yeah. Um, and I am, I don't know how to 
uh, even start approaching what we do about journalism now with the people who are being uh, trained in all these schools in, in advocacy journalism and I don't, I don't even know what else, but I don't see, we, there are so many stories out there. COVID is the most, the richest mine for any journalist, serious real journalist yeah. of the past for stories. There could have been like hundreds of Pulitzer winners yeah. who were out there investigating all the stuff that went on during COVID. There's still a million things to investigate and there aren't anybody doing the investigation except for I know. Us, you know, and it, it's crazy. People. Yeah. Um, and and so you you know, yeah, it gave me a whole new life <laughs> and a whole new identity and a whole new purpose to be doing that investigation. But I don't want to be doing it alone. Uh, and I don't want us to be the only ones who are doing. Um, I'll tell you a funny story uh, because I'm getting more and more of a sense of collegiality and privacy here, even though we're being live streamed on Epoch Television. Um, <laughs> But it was funny because uh, Brownstown has very limited resources and I had already given out all of our fellowships, you know? And I was like, we're poor. So Debbie calls up, she said, she said uh, I would like to be a fellow. And I said, but Debbie, that won't be possible. <laughs> and she said, you don't understand. I am spending all my time doing research and writing for you. My husband is furious. <laughs> If you would make me a fellow, I would have an excuse. I said, all right, you're a fellow. <laughs> it's true. I just wanted the title. <laughs> just the legitimacy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because uh, the, legit, the journalists who call themselves journalists, uh, I don't know what they're doing. Yeah. But they're not investigating, and they're not... Um, I don't know, it's so exciting when you, the, the amount of documents that are out there and the amount of things that we still need to get our hands on uh, through FOIAs and information requests, not just from the US government, for, but from many, many governments around the world who I think we're all working in concert. Um, there's just so much material out there that if you were a journalist, it would be a, a feast, <laughs> um, a wealth of uh, material to investigate. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand yeah. where the people are. So I think something that would be helpful, Brownstone might want to do this, would they do a weekly roundup of the really good articles that are coming out on COVID. Yeah. Uh, sometimes in small papers, sometimes in foreign sources. There is good stuff being written and published and, or put online. It's not getting nearly as much traction as it should. Yeah. But there are journalists out there who are nailing some of the lies, some of the abuses, and some of the collateral damage. I mean, it's not a tidal wave. It's certainly not predominant. But it's out there. And the folks could just have a simple place where, okay, uh, you know, for this week, let's go here. And you might have something from a small paper in South Texas. You might have something from, you know, the Washington Times. And some of it might be credible, some of it might not be. But, you know, to have a good, solid roundup. So maybe somebody's already doing that. Is anybody already doing uh, that? A Daily Skeptic does some of that, I think. A yeah. uh, Daily Skeptic. Okay. Yeah. All right. I was wrong. No, but, no, they, but, but you're right. We need something like that. I mean, our... our um, um, as you've gathered, our staff is, is tiny, you know. We have four, four staffers, and that's, that's up from three from two weeks ago, so, uh, so but uh, uh, there's so much uh, more to do. Um, Adam, you were about to say something. Oh, just, just to sound an optimistic note on the media, I think they will return to these stories eventually. I just think there's a reluctance for a year or two, perhaps, for so many of the editors and senior journalists uh, themselves champion these policies that, that they don't really want to go near the vaccine injuries, say, or the disasters of lockdown because they supported them. But inevitably, through attrition, there'll be new editors arrive, there'll be younger journalists arrive who were not part of the decision making. And yeah. I, think, I think the economic incentive to pursue the story will will triumph in the long term. Right. Uh, and you know, we can say the same thing in my view about COVID inquiries, you know, which are being held in some countries right now. I don't think they're going to be fair inquiries because uh, the people who made the decisions are still in power. And quite often the people who are overseeing the inquiries uh, supported those decisions. 
at least in private, and so you're not going to get an honest answer. So I think it's best to have these inquiries, these sort of reckonings in four or five years' time. Yeah, it's so funny how you say that with such confidence. Well, they were wrong, so they, didn't, they never want to admit it. But I did not know that is the way it would work. When I saw everybody was wrong from March on, I thought, well, everybody's wrong, so everybody will be very shortly admitting it. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, listen to you, Father. This is a man who hears confessions all day, you know? <laughs> He's over there going, oh, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I didn't realize that people would be so invested in their fake story, fake narratives. Yeah. Gabriel, go ahead. Well, Jeffrey, I think you, you alluded to before March, there were people who were questioning this, and then something happened. I think the same tribalism that took hold of all sectors took hold of the journalistic sector. Yeah. And so it just became a question of allegiance to tribe. And I'm finding that even now in, in trying to promote my book, left, no, right-leaning or libertarian news outlets are so much more receptive than left-leaning ones, predictably, and very disappointingly, because one of my purposes in writing the book was to talk to both sides of the yep. And it's, you know, I've had the most amazing and interesting podcasts with many people in this room and, and people on the right libertarian side, but how to break through, how to break through to the other side is something that I just rack my head. Um, uh, and this, yeah. this left-right issue uh, is, a, is a peculiar one for me because, yeah. uh, because I, I don't care left-right, doesn't matter to me, but I will tell you that overwhelmingly our writer, core writers, um, are, 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 consider themselves from the left, uh, historically speaking. Um, I don't know why that is, you know, and, and where do I understand, you know, how it comes to be that these days you know, our audience tends to be from the right. I'm not sure I understand any of this anymore. Well, I think that was caused by Donald Trump, sadly. Not, not, it wasn't his intention, but I think when he hinted throughout 2020 that he didn't support lockdowns, although he was involved in the original rollout, I think the left just recalled in horror, and then they've associated anyone who, uh, who opposed lockdowns with Donald Trump. Trump, yeah, which of course is logically absurd, but, yeah. but that's the reality because, I mean, I always saw lockdowns as far more damaging to the poor, both in rich countries and throughout the world. Right. And so you'd think it was naturally a left-wing response to you oppose them. So. Yeah. Uh, and of course, all of the wealth inequality that they created as well. I mean, an extraordinary increase in wealth inequality, which you'd think the left would hate, and yet they seem to be quite okay with it. It's very strange. Uh, now, you know the old meme of the person who stands in place, who's on the left, but then the, the Overton window moves and moves, so like in 2005 they were on the left, and then in 2021 they're suddenly far right. Yeah. Political opinions haven't changed, but the zeitgeist has changed. Debbie? Uh, I'm going to be the pessimist in the room. Uh, because I'm also going to introduce the whole subject of censorship uh -huh. uh, because we have our group now um, and I do think that that's probably the most important issue uh, that we have to deal with as journalists and as truth seekers um, and some of the explanations for everything that we've been talking about um, have to do with the censorship industrial complex and the propaganda industrial complex all of which started before COVID um, all of which were controlled by what was considered the left mm. uh, in censoring the right. I'm, I'm from a, what I considered a liberal leftist democratic background. Totally never voted for a Republican, you know, didn't like Trump, all of that stuff. It's all gone now. Um, and, uh, but I know, having come from that world, uh, that the virtue and belief in doing the right thing that the people have on that side in terms of we're doing the right thing by excluding these views and excluding uh, these inconvenient facts um, that are going against our narrative is very strong. There's a very strong belief that that's a good thing. And so in addition to training our young journalists to be advocates for whatever, um, we're also training them to be censors. And so a whole generation of really smart and motivated people who want to do good in the world are being told that the way to do good is to make sure that there's only one narrative. 
and I think that's a, an explanation for a lot of the yeah. stuff that's been going on. Yeah, and real censorship had, from the very, very beginning of the lockdowns, I mean, uh, Elon Musk recently gave an interview to, what's his name, Joe Rogan, where he said that Twitter 1.0 was, might as well have been a, a government uh, yeah, exactly. yeah. Uh, thing, and, and you remember those days, right? I mean, we felt very much alone. I felt like I was a lone guy out there. And it turns out, it, yeah, maybe we were somewhat a minority opinion, but the main problem is that we weren't allowed to find each other. You know? We still aren't. And, and actually, again, to bring a note of pessimism or realism, um, Google's algorithms, I am positive are suppressing brownstone severely. And yeah. Everybody here, everybody here who's written anything, any books, any articles, the Google algorithm is not promoting them and is suppressing them. And so, uh, not just Twitter, it's not just the social media companies, Google is the biggest information broker in the world. I mean, that's it, that's where the information comes from. And if their algorithms aren't neutral, then I, I, I don't know what to do about it. <laughs> it's really, really hard. And I feel like Brownstone, um, it's miraculous that we've become as uh, known yeah. and successful, but we would have be hundreds of times more known and more popular if there wasn't that suppression going sure, on. Sure, sure. Um, Sure. Uh, we've we've dealt a lot with these fact fact checkers, which we now know are mostly, uh, you know, intelligence agency um, hirelings, uh, and and they write us all the time and come at us hammer and talk. I just delete these. I just I just delete them. I mean, I'm not going to answer these. But I had one conversation with one of these idiots uh, one time because uh, I looked up his background and I found out who he was and it doesn't matter but, um, but but just deleting these emails you know they, they, they write us all the time harassing us about this point or that point and threat basically it's a, a mild threat but I just I just delete them and then they come out with their stupid story and I don't, nobody seems to care I mean it's it's all dumb I've, I've learned this like the, the more afraid you are of them the more effective they are like you just you give them oxygen when you panic about about them. Yeah. You ampl amplify their attacks. So, uh, oh yeah, this happened the other day. Um, you know, Rolling Stone. Do you know this magazine, Rolling Stone? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyway, they had a big attack on, did you even know this? They attacked, no, you didn't know because I didn't tell anybody, but they had a big attack. Oh, Brownstone's bad. Um, funded by, by a billionaire child labor advocate, Jeffrey Tucker. Okay. <laughs> How am I going to respond to that? Um, it was a dumb attack. And I just, I, I looked at it, I, said, I sent it to Luisman, uh, our web guy, and, and it was linking to us throughout the whole thing. Well, we have analytics too, right? We can see who's coming from that story to go, who are these bad people? And I said, Lou, let's keep track of all the links coming in from, uh, from Rolling Stone with this big, big smashing attack on us. Um, a week later, he reported, Nobody's reading this crap. I mean, that's the bottom line. It's just not, they're not reading it. So it's not having, I mean, isn't that interesting? That is Rolling Stone, you think Rolling Stone tried to take us down. I, I didn't write a big article. Oh no, I was scared of Rolling Stone. I didn't write anything about it. I didn't tell anyone about it. I don't even think you know about it. I did. Oh, you did know about it. It's Walker Bragman. I know everything about Walker Bragman. Oh, Walter Bragman, yeah. <laughs> Me to take over. James, go ahead. About what? Oh, anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, it's interesting to see how the, the controversies are playing out. I guess I'm not as jaded on fact checkers. I've dealt with them often. Enough. Well, if I'm writing for some papers, I mean, there's, it's like a, uh, could be a Chinese water torture. Uh, but they've, you know, sometimes they've been very helpful in finding errors that I didn't realize that were in pieces uh, post publication. Uh, some of the challenges have been total BS. Every now and then uh, I get a contact from someone and uh, the, the, he or she is raising a, a question and I, and I send my sources and sometimes they've said, yeah, okay, fine. 
that said, okay, it holds up. So. Yeah. You know, uh, Jim, I've never asked you this, but how do you maintain such a lightness of being? <laughs> lightness of being. You do. I mean, you were writing, you know, for your whole career has been splitting throats and well, I, um, debunking lies and everything, and yet you're all joyful and charming. I enjoy throwing rocks, especially at the government. But so, I, and, and uh, since you mentioned, I, I was, you know, I made, I, I, I modified my attire for this because I was at the dinner last night and I was wearing a coat and tie, and there was this very nice lady sitting at the same table, and she said, she said that I looked like a lawyer. <laughs> the effort in any way, Jeff. <laughs> That's good. Well, um, you can line up for questions. I, I don't know what we're going to do about this microphone problem, though. Do we have an extra uh, spare microphone somewhere? Um, yeah, or, or, yeah, Father, go ahead. Let's pretend as if it's, <laughs> yeah, pretend as if there's a microphone. Uh, I'd like to introduce another consideration, is that we've self-selected our journalists to be almost exclusively of the personality trait of agreeableness. <laughs> I don't see that. No, no, I mean, I know a lot of journalists, and that's, that's, that's conformity the... and politeness, at least within their circle. Anymore. I think that's true. I think it's a very true observation. But people don't like to rock the boat in journalism. I don't care who I'm going to tick off, I'm going to break the story. That's right. I'm just competitive. That trait seems to be absent. Mm. I think it's still there to a degree. I think there, and there's certainly no shortage of abrasive assholes in journalism. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. I mean, some people even said that about me. So, um, no, I, I mean, there is there's, there's a hurt instinct. I mean, it's uh, the, the, the point that y'all were making earlier about a lot of them went to the same college, the same graduate school. I think a lot of the fundamental trouble with the coverage for the pan COVID pandemic uh, was the same as what the mistakes have made, at least going back to 9-11, a blind trust in authority and government. They are so deferential to government officials. It's interesting, if you look back at journalism in the 1940s or 50s, a lot of them started out being police reporters. And one thing you learn being a police reporter is that the police lie all the time. <laughs> and, and, and folks take the same lesson to look at the local politicians and then to look at the members of Congress and the president and the Pentagon. And so journalists have lost this instinct about government being a perpetual pervasive liar. There are some honest officials and some honest agencies, but they have lost that gut instinct about like, okay, the government says this, you know, where's my BS radar? So. And also they might be government agents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or, 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 uh, and, uh, or the flip side is they're hoping to get a job with the government after they yes. finish with the New York Times yes. or yeah. Washington Post. Yes. Yeah. So New York Times government. Operation Mockingbird was exposed exactly. in the mid-1970s yes. where the CIA had all these top journalists on their payroll. Yep. So I was shocked. <laughs> Still waiting for my check, though, I must say. <laughs> Paula. Hi. Um, I think a critical thing here with COVID is that if it look who has been adversely impacted by it, the poor, the single parents. And there's no lobbyists, there are very few lobbyists who lobby for the poor. And when you talk about the journalists who, you know, who've gone to Harvard, Ivy League schools, where is their reference point for want, for need? You know, it's like the, lap, the laptop class, you know, they weren't really affected. Yeah. But who's speaking up so in reference to journalists with their privilege? Where is their connection to not having money to, to feed your family or fix your car or pay your rent. So I think there's a skewed perspective, once again, of the plight yeah. of the people who were really affected yeah. by COVID. Yeah. There was, it's, it's interesting, there was a focus by places like the Washington Post and other places, they were very much, they were, um, they claimed to be concerned about that issue, but the answer was to give more food stamps. 
Right. And, yes. and uh, just as long as you had more government handouts, then it didn't matter how many livelihoods were destroyed or how many people were locked in their houses or how many people committed suicide by because of depression, because the government had this handout and that handout and this handout. So, you know, it, it, it was the politicians absolved themselves with handouts. Yeah. So It wasn't just, too, that the uh, laptop class were not harmed. I mean, I think the depressing reality is many of these people actually benefited from these policies because their costs went down, whether it was, you know, travelling to work. Uh, they had to work less, uh, certainly in the case of teachers and academics who were often the most stridently in favour of these policies. Yeah. It was, you know, it, just, it was just coincidence, yeah. of course, that they happened to actually benefit the most. <laughs> Do you remember that video when uh, Fauci went to Anacostia? Oh, <laughs> and wonderful. D yes. DC, and, and he was trying to... Yes. Yeah, he was selling his vaccine, and this guy said, I'm not going to take this crazy shot you invented in 10 minutes, but, you know, why should I... Why should I... And Fauci said, we've been working on it for 30 years. And I said, yeah, but and the fact that you're having to arrive at my front door makes me very suspicious, you know. Well, it, it wasn't just the front door. That it was a, a, a black guy on his doorstep in Anacostia, the poorest area of D.C., yeah. but he was so much better than the Washington journalists. Oh, my God, that's for sure. He just pushed back. He had questions. Well, it's already approved in seven months, you know. Yeah. I mean, if it's so good, how come you're offering to pay me for it? And, yeah. uh, Here's what about this damn TV uh, camera crew there? But it, it's funny that, 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 that PBS was so pro Fauci that, that PBS thought showing that would help Fauci's. Yeah. Uh, and then Fauci got in his car and put on hand sanitizer. <laughs> yep. My name is Carl Eric Scott. I write, a, I write a Substack, Postmodern Conservative, and you know we're having a good time, but um, it's kind of a dark period. And I want you guys to speak to a sort of dark hypothesis that's been haunting me. This whole COVID vax disaster has implicated like 80, 95, maybe even higher of elites in journalism, medicine, medicine across the board. These people have incredible incentive to keep covering up things. No one is talking in, on any any official channel about the big radioactive one, the vax harms, the deaths. Yeah. And I'm worried these people are just like, gosh, we've gotten away for it for a year and a half. Why not continue? What's in it for me, possibly, to let it come out? Yep. I agree. We, we have, uh, I think we have a science panel committee. Yeah, Godek, Thacker, Damasi, Malone a little later, and we're surely going to address some of those. Those. Uh, oh, and I see Toby Rogers. <laughs> The very dangerous Toby Rogers is coming up a little later. So, yeah, those are good points. It's uh, you know, um, but this is how it usually works when the government screws things up completely. Most of the culprits are uh, don't have any culpability or liability, and the uh, the outrages get buried. And uh, it, it's interesting if you look at the uh, U.S. government torture scandal that started under George W. Bush completely swept under the rug. Senator Feinstein was one of the few people who pushed back, but uh, she died and almost nobody nobody recalled her finest hour of pushing back against the CIA torture cover-up, so it's sad. Yeah, but she completely neglected the most recent CIA torture cover-up. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, you know, as far as the COVID? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no, she was, uh, I, I was opposed to her on almost everything, but but she, she showed courage on that issue. Mm -hmm. She also, I think, might have said two or three good sentences on the NS, on the surveillance scandal, but yeah. not much. So. Yeah. I, I think there's a simple explanation that people are essentially afraid of losing their livelihoods and their jobs. It just keeps going. And um, I had to consider that too. I'm a freelance um, writer, but I have a lot of clients. Uh, but I'm in the fortunate position that I don't have young children anymore, so I was able to take these take risks. risks yeah. But I have certainly thought about what if I had a young family to feed? Yeah. What would I do? Yeah. I don't know. I don't have the yeah. an answer. Yeah. And I think that's what's stopping. S so sadly, I don't think Substack solves this problem either because uh, there's people that are making a living from Substack, and I thought that was the greatest thing ever. But the problem is that if, if you say things that your audience doesn't like, you know, you're going to face it's, – it's actually an issue. So I don't, I don't know what the answer is. Um, Dr. Malone, let's go. 
Thanks. I'm Robert Malone. Um, uh, I'm glad that I heard the word drop Mockingbird. Um, uh, Jill and I are in the middle of finalizing our book on Psy War and Sovereignty. And uh, in that context, I've spent a lot of time now reading the Church Commission reports and Carl Bernstein's uh, breakthrough expose in Rolling Stone that carried that narrative quite a bit farther forward, but still did not really get to the underlying depth and extent of the tendrils that extend uh, from CIA and the mighty Wurlitzer which go back to 1942 in OSS, um, carry through to the present. And uh, what the Church Commission pulled their punches on was not only the integration of CIA in journalism, because journalists are such great cover, particularly international journalists, uh, but also their deep involvement in academe, which I can testify from personal experience is, is a fact, okay? My point is that the group is, uh, I think, making, you're, you're groping the elephant and you're making the same uh, assertion that Brett Weinstein made on that infamous podcast with Steve Kirsch and I, which is that this is an emergent uh, property of a complex system. I disagree. Um, here's the fundamental observation. This uh, PSYOP propaganda campaign occurred simultaneously throughout the Western world in a harmonized fashion using exactly the same language and strategies. The strategies that have been deployed are identical to those that are described for the, in the church report for COINTELPRO, which was the FBI's campaign to disrupt and uh, um, delegitimize uh, the civil rights protest and the anti-Vietnam War protest in the 1960s. They are the same exact tactics. And they are the same exact tactics that were used in by Mockingbird. This long-standing program that's been central to the CIA throughout its entire existence. Furthermore, there's this assertion that the CIA is in some way prevented from engaging in domestic surveillance and propaganda. That is absolutely false. It is not consistent with the statutes that empower CIA. Okay. It's also very clear and explicit in the 2010 PSYOPs manual, PSYWAR manual for the U.S. Army, um, signed off by the current Secretary of Defense, um, that uh, there's a clause in there that specifically says that the U.S. Army PSYOPs and PSYWAR capabilities can be deployed in against civilian populations in the event of a national emergency. And I've had multiple retired colonels from that, those divisions come up to me as I speak about PSYWAR and say that's exactly what has happened. They're furious about it because we've had technology developed for offshore combat deployed against our own citizens. So my assertion is that these organic bottom-up type of emergent phenomena that you're observing um, are a partial explanation, but they're inconsistent with the data of globally harmonized purchase and manipulation of influencers, musicians, comedians that has occurred all across the Western world and in particular in the Five Eyes Nations, Canada, United States, Great Britain, New Zealand, and Australia, uh -huh. all harmonized, uh -huh. okay? That we're dealing, we're dealing there, let me put it this way. I'm not aware, and please educate me if you are, of any organization in the world that has this level of reach that could manage that type of a harmonized propaganda right. and psy war campaign other than the intelligence community with its Five Eyes extended alliances. Uh -huh. And they absolutely are integrated into modern journalism and most of the major publications. And you can see that because you can watch the harmonized messaging that comes out globally from the major publications that is in many ways tied together by the 
BBC's Trusted News Initiative, yeah. which manages all of this. Yeah. And underlying that is the perception that alternative media, which is what Brownstone is, let's call it what it is, okay? Brownstone is a home for a, a decentralized web of alternative media authors. That's true. And uh, in Politico, I think recently, it was referred to as Minutemen journalists using a reference to the uh, American Revolution. These pop-up uh, guerrillas, really, is what they are. What we're talking about is guerrilla journalism, okay, coming up through alternative media, and it is perceived as a major threat against centralized corporate media and information control, and it must be destroyed. Okay. It cannot be allowed to be to persist because it is both a financial threat and it's a threat to control mechanisms operating through the control of all information that the public is exposed to, which is being controlled by the government and is occurring now. Mockingbird has gone big. It's got its own branches now. Yeah. Scott Gottlieb created one, yeah. right? Um, this new, whole new intelligence complex that he created through his lobby. Mm -hmm. through Face the Nation and other organizations, right? Um, and uh, that, that's what we're dealing with. This, this is not an organic um, emergent phenomenon because uh, poor journalists are afraid that they're not going to be able to feed their families. This is centralized control, yeah. and it is global, and it is harmonized. Yeah. And until we come to terms with the fact that we have our Western governments are willing, capable, and actively deploying information control technology and strategies that have been um, uh, accelerated beyond the wildest dreams of uh, the Great Wurlitzer days and Operation Mockingbird cir circa the 1970s because of integration into social media. Until we come to terms with that, yeah. we're, we are lost. We're continuing to peck away at the fringes. Yeah. And um, so I, I, I wish that I would hear journalists speaking up about the integration of the intelligence community into journalism, and I wish I would hear academics speaking up about the integration of the intelligence community into academe. Both organizations have been completely compromised, as we've seen throughout this. But the thing is, I assert, it's by intent. It's not an accident. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Dr. Malone. I mean, it's, it's incredible to think that it was 10 years ago when Ed Snowden came out with all the revelations about the NSA spying on, on, on Americans. Back in those days, he said a, a quarter million Americans are being surveilled you know, by NSA, and everybody said, eh. That's weird. And that was it, right? There was no real reforms. Nothing, nothing happened. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Emily Kaplan, um, and I am the co-founder of the Broken Science Initiative, and I also have a crisis management firm that's helped a lot of people who have been canceled through COVID and otherwise. And I just thought it was, in, I used to be an investigative reporter. And so one of the things that's really interesting to me is there are some really interesting statistics about how and why the media has become so easy to manipulate. And I think we can't forget that in New York in the early days there was such a panic, which is where most of the media in the United States is. And then there are also the really interesting things, like when I started out 20 years ago, the average age in the newsroom was like 47. Mm. Now it's like 27. Yeah. So there's no experience. There also used to be a culture where yeah. you would go in as a newspaper reporter, pitch a story, have a bunch of old men yell at you, tell you it was stupid, yeah. go back to your desk, find more information. Right. With cancel culture now, that's not allowed. Yeah. Right? And then you add things to that, like when I was starting out in newspapers, I wrote one story a day, and I would have weeks to work on something longer. When I call newspapers today to ask for a correction with verifiable proof that they've gotten something wrong, I often find that the reporters were really reporting off of a release somebody sent them. Right. They're writing six, seven stories a day. That's yeah. comparable to what I was doing a week. And it was hard to do that a week. So I think we have to have a little bit of grace. I think we're all angry. But I also think when I get on the phone with some of these people, they're young. And their intentions are actually good. 
They want to be challenging authority. They don't have time to do it. But when you talk them through how they got it wrong or other places that they should look, they're often far more open to it, and they might not help you with that story, but you'll start to notice that their next stories are a little more critical. Mm. No one's hanging out with cops. No one's going through court records. They just don't have time to do it. Yeah. And so I think to add to that, I started in newspapers. I've written for magazines, had columns, was a young producer at 2020 in primetime, and Good Morning America I did a lot of stuff for. What was interesting to me to go to TV was that there was very little original reporting. We would sit around a table with the executive producers of the show, and every morning we would each be responsible for reading five to six newspapers. That's where all the content came from. Mm -hmm. So the sort of chain of custody, when you look at a local story and how it's getting used, yeah. the decimation of local newspapers, and local newspapers no longer being owned by families that were happy with a great profit margin yeah. by most considerations of other business examples, now it's publicly traded, you have to get more every month. They've absolutely cut the newsroom. They're hiring kids they can pay nothing with no training. So we have to kind of remember these things. So Jeffrey, this conference is my third year coming. I love coming. It's such a great group of people. So thank you for doing thank it. Thank you. Um, One little other yeah. thing about your the Rolling Stone piece mm. that I've learned is that I had a client who's a big um, satire outlet. And they wanted to sue the New York Times for calling them you know, fake news. Oh. They couldn't because for defamation you have to show damages. And it so drastically helped their circulation for the New York Times to call them fake news that there's actually a real opportunity. When you have news outlets writing bad things about you, it's a great way to drive your own traffic because so many people yeah. are becoming wise well, to That this. time could come. I just didn't think it was there at the Rolling Stone thing. Plus, I wanted to try an experiment. Uh, I had a theory that, that, that nobody reads this crap, and I was right. So, yeah, it was fun. Um, Emily, our, you came last year and the year before. Uh, two previous years, we started this program in the afternoon. Do you think we did a good job this morning? I think it's been fantastic. Okay. Else like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're, uh, we're going to take a break for lunch. I'm sorry to have held you over, uh, but it, this is so good. Thank you all so very much. We'll see you uh, after lunch.